In this video, we are going to introduce you to Kismet. So what is Kismet exactly? Kismet is Unreal's visual scripting system. That's right. Kismet plays a vital role in the creation of any interactive levels inside of Unreal. But anytime anyone hears that word, scripting, well, if they are not a programmer, they generally get frightened. Yeah, you might be scared right now. That's but right. But the good news is, all because we say scripting doesn't mean you should get scared, because it is a visual scripting language. So in essence, all you're doing is creating logical block diagrams of types of actions you'd like to see occur in your level. Right. It's a very intuitive approach to scripting that is very approachable by non-coders, such as artists and level designers or people like myself. And Zach just said the key thing, non Coders, no code. That's right. That's You're right. not going to be sitting there at an IDE programming out logical statements. That's good news. Instead, you're going to be working with building blocks that do very specific tasks, and you're going to be tying these blocks together to accomplish some sort of sequence within your level. That's right. Now, here inside of this level, we have a very simple Kismet sequence already set up. So let's take just a moment and pop into the game and show you what we've got real quick, okay. and then we'll talk about that. So I'll just right-click here inside my level. We'll choose Play from here. Now, before Zach actually goes over here and touches this trigger, let's talk about what he's got set up. Basically, he wants something set up where a user could interact with this trigger, which is more or less like just a switch. And when he uses this trigger, what's going to happen is we're going to get a message at the bottom that he's used it, and the system is going to start counting down. And we want it to actually echo this countdown out to our interface, just so that we could see what's happening inside our Kismet network. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see five, four, three, two, one. And when we hit zero, the lights are going to kill. So yep. the lights are going to go out. It's going to be mostly dark in the room. Then after a very quick delay, it's then going to say that the system is restarting. We're going to get another countdown, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and the light's going to come back on. This is an example of a very simple sequence. Let's go ahead and do it. All right, so we walk up to it. I press the E key, and we get, you have triggered the time light switch. And we count down from 5. Watch what happens when we hit 0. Boom, lights go out. Okay, and then again, the small delay. System is restarting in, and we get the countdown once again. And boom, the lights come back on. And of course, in putting these sequences together, it's very important to start thinking of everything that the player could be doing that could affect your sequence in an adverse way. That's right. In this particular case, what would happen if Zach walked up and clicked the trigger and it, the system started counting down, then he tried clicking it again, causing it to, well, basically step on itself. Well, that has to be accounted for when putting together your networks inside of Kismet, and Zach has done that here. So if he tries to use it again, well, while it's in the middle of running its sequence, it's not going to cause a problem because he has accounted for that. Yeah, more or less we've locked out inputs from the user while we're counting down. And these are little things that you probably won't know when you first set up your sequence. That's you right. might go into it just having a general idea of what you want to happen and test it out and say, ooh, it would be a problem if, like in this case, the, the user started just really pounding on the E key. That's right. So we'll uh, do it for him. All right, well, Hit yeah. the E key. Right listen, now, guys, listen, yeah. listen carefully. And, and you'll nothing. notice, yeah, you'll notice that everything is acting properly there on our interface. That's right. And that's just because we, uh, we tested it out, realized that was a problem, and came back in. Now, Zach, this is a very simple sequence. Mm -hmm. We're turning a light off. We're turning it back on. What else can you do with <laughs> Kismet? <laughs> well, the answer is really anything that you can imagine in terms of some sort of a reactionary effect. Uh, you could have enemies spawned into your map. You could have uh, a cinematic sequence fire off. You can have lifts activate. You can have animated uh, objects come in. There's all sorts you of things. You can trigger a thunderstorm you and trigger have a th it start raining. Exactly. Change the musical soundtrack. Stream in another level into your, uh, into your gameplay map. As your health gets lower and lower, more monsters spawn in. You could kill the player. I mean, <laughs> it, it goes on and on. And as you guys start experimenting with Kismet and start working with it, you're going to learn that there's all sorts of things that you can expose your player to uh, as a reaction That's to right. whatever you're doing. Now, let's go ahead and close the in-editor game. Now, let's take a look at this Kismet sequence. Now, you can find the uh, Kismet sequences for your map up here inside the Kismet editor. You can find this inside the toolbar, a little green K icon. Just click on that, and here we are. So yeah. here's uh, the, the Kismet editor. Again, as we said a second ago, you can kind of think of this like a flowchart, mm -hmm. a block diagram of what needs to occur. And we have a series of blocks that are all tied together. Now, if Zach was to zoom back just a little bit, it's going to look just a little intimidating at first. 
But really, the nice thing is, is it's very logical. And once you get comfortable working with sequence objects here, it becomes very intuitive connecting all of this together. Not to mention, this wasn't all created at one time. It's not like we just started from left to right and sort of dropping in blocks and knew exactly where everything was going to connect. You'll find that as you get deeper into visual scripting, you start off very simple with just the functionality you need. In this case, maybe turning the light on and off. Then uh, you can add in the timer after that. So it's not like you have to know every single thing you need as soon as you jump in. In fact, once you first start getting into visual scripting with Kismet, you're going to find it's going to be easiest to take a pen and paper and write down what effect you want in English before you even get started. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Now, before we start diving into the creation of some sort of very simple sequence, let's go over some basic terminology. And there's some things that you're going to need to know. First, what is a scripted sequence? Well, you're looking at one right now. You technically are. To define it, it is a series of events and actions that take place according to conditions and rules that are specified before gameplay. I built this sequence before the game actually started. It was not generated at runtime. Now, I can have runtime elements affect that, as we've seen. When the player hits a trigger, something happens. But it's all based on rules and conditions that I established before gameplay began. Another term you're going to come across is the is sequence objects. Now, what is a sequence object? Everything you see here inside of this pane. Zoom in on some of them. Yeah. These are all sequence objects, some form of sequence object. And there are a lot of different types of sequence objects available to you while you're working with Kismet. That's right. Now, I'll talk about uh, more of the individual types of sequence objects you'll see a little bit later on as we go on. Next, connections. You see these little wires? I can mouse over them and they change colors, which is really kind of cool. These are connections. You're going to be using these to send data along your Kismet sequence. It's how you make one uh, sequence object talk to another or transmit something to it. It's going to be very important to actually get your sequence to flow correctly. Exactly. Next, we have variables. These circular uh, sequence objects you see here are variables. And a variable is simply a container that stores some type of data. And that data could be something like a simple number. Mm -hmm. It could be a piece of text, such as... You have triggered the time light switch. It could be a Boolean, such as a true or false. I mean, it could be an object. That's right. It could be an object even, such as the uh, light in our scene, point light toggleable. That is actually an object variable right there. You'll also notice, just kind of offhand, that these different types of variables are color-coded. Object variables are going to be pink, Boolean values in red, string or or word uh, alphanumeric style variables are going to be in green. And uh, in this case, an integer, which is a number without a decimal point, is in the cyan color. So keep that in mind. It's really going to help you out because you're going to see various types of connections connections on some of your sequence objects, like, for example, this uh, set integer uh, sequence object here has two cyan connections on the bottom of it. That tells you immediately that this is looking for an integer style uh, variable to plug into. That's right. But as Zach said, keep in mind, variables are nothing more than containers for some sort of data. That's right. Now, another term you're going to need to know, or actually two terms, I'll just throw them out at the same time and then we'll define them, are events and actions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, these are kind of the heart of where, uh, where Kismet goes when you start using it, or how Kismet works. An event is something that happens in your level. That can trigger or start a chain reaction of things. That's exactly right. It's a catalyst. That's right. And in our case, uh, our event is this trigger being used. The event is not the trigger itself. That's a, you know, don't, don't let yourself fall into that. The event is the fact that the player has walked up to the trigger and pressed the E key to actually use it. Because they have done that, they have fired off this event. Now, after that, you have actions. Every other, well, the square nodes you see here, all of these sequence objects are essentially some form of action or some sort of supplement to help the actions along. Technically speaking, uh, one of the key actions we have here would be this toggle action. And what this is doing is actually toggling our light on and off. It's toggling a target. In this case, that target happens to be our toggleable light. Right. Now, we have some other sequence objects here that are technically not actions. We have comparisons, which are checking to see if one value is, as you can see here, greater than or less than or equal to. And it's allowing our sequence to make decisions and change its data flow based on the numbers it finds. And that's going to be important in uh, producing our countdown or running loops and things like that later on. That's right. So 
that's a that's a look at all the terminology you really need to to understand if you've never seen kismet before. You need to at least be exposed to that. But there is one final thing I'd like to point out before we start getting our hands nice and dirty, putting something simple together. And that is, as Zach goes through here and clicks on the different sequence objects, you'll notice in the bottom left-hand corner that we have parameters that are specific to that sequence object. He has just selected. That's right. They're going to keep changing. If I click on this integer variable, you'll notice I can change its uh, default value. I can add comments to it. And we'll talk more about using these as we get deeper into actually using Kismet. But if I jump over to this subtract int and actually change change with the values A and B, what I'd like to subtract. With my log, you'll notice they all change. So each time you click on a different sequence object, you're going to get a different series of properties. And sometimes these properties are going to get very in-depth. That's right. Now, at this point, what we'd like to do is go ahead and move on to some sort of example. So let's go ahead and close Kismat out at the moment. Okay. Now, do a new level for me. All right. So let's just go to File. New And because I'm doing a demo map and I'm not uh, doing anything really spectacular, I'm going to do a simple subtractive map. So we'll make that go away for just a moment. And let's right-click. And I've already got my 1024 by 1024 by 512 block in there, so we'll build. I'll close. I'll chop that out by hitting the CSG subtract button. Then I'm going to hold down the L key and click in the middle of the room and create a light, which I will drag immediately up to the ceiling. And the idea of having this light in there, since we're going to have this toggleable light added in just a minute, that's going to be a secondary light. This light here is going to be set to a very low level of illumination so that when the toggleable light is flipped off, we still have some light left. Right, we still see something, so we're not right. completely blind. So let me go ahead and just double-click this to open up its properties, and we've got all sorts of properties already open. But I'm just going to jump down to its light parameters, and we'll take brightness and set it into 0 0.04. Very, very dim. In fact, on the video itself, you might not even be able to see anything. But if you're doing this, if you're following along in Unreal Ed, you're going to see you can just barely make out the walls. Now, next to this, we need some sort of a light that we can turn on and off. Don't think that you can just right-click and arbitrarily go to Add Actor and create a light. There are lights already available for you, so you don't have to dig into the Actor Class browser, but that's the wrong kind of light. So let's go up to our toolbar, and we'll click on the Generic Browser button, and then jump over to the next tab for the Actor Class browser. And I will expand our Light class... I'll also expand point light, and you're going to see that you have point light toggleable. This is a special kind of light that is uh, specifically used for turning on and off. So we'll close this out. I'll right-click on my floor and choose Add Point Light Toggleable here. So I have a separate light. I'm just going to move this halfway up in the room so that the differences in altitude will make it easy to identify sure. one or the other. With this, uh, let's see, what else do we need? I guess we need some sort of a way to turn the lights on and off. That's right. We need to put our light switch into the level. And we'll do exactly what we did before, which is have a trigger. Now, fortunately, triggers are always available to you. You don't have to dig into the Actor Class browser if you don't want to. You can just right-click on the floor, go to Add Actor, and you'll see Add Trigger. Click, and there you go. Now, there is one catch. If you play through this map right now, you will not be able to see this trigger. Typically, a trigger is something that is hidden. You place it uh, right at the surface of a static mesh, so you walk up to the static mesh and maybe use it, or some other uh, type of actor. You wouldn't actually want to use this icon, but because we're just doing proof of concept, it'll be helpful if we can see the icon. So I'll double-click this to open up its properties, and underneath the display category, we see be hidden, deactivate that, and then close properties. That means we'll be able to see this icon while we play the map. All right, so we have all the elements we need. We have a dim light just for some base illumination. We have our toggleable light that we're going to be uh, turning off and on. I say off first because it's already on by default. That's right. And uh, we have the trigger, so now all we need is to set up our Kismet sequence. Well, before we start, let's go ahead and rebuild our level here. So it's going to take just a second for all of this to run through, about 15 seconds or so. All right. So we'll let all of these calculations take place. But now that we've got all of our actors set up, it's just going to be a matter of going into Kismet and connecting some things up. That's right. Now, we'll say this. If for some reason you want the light to be off when you come in, you can just double-click this light, open up its properties, and under the light parameters, uncheck Be Enabled, and don't worry about this error message is just uh, unreal warning us that we still have the default checker on the walls of our room, which is not really a concern for us in this particular case. Okay, so at this point, let's go ahead and jump into Kismet. All right, I'll click the open Kismet editor button. Now it's nice and empty because we have started a new level. So where do we begin? Well, see, that's the thing. Uh, if you're completely new to Kismet, this could be the part where you get overwhelmed and afraid and you don't really know what to do. So it helps to take a second and think about what you want to have happen in English or your native language. <laughs> and you, you just want to think about what is my final goal. I want to use a switch 
to turn a light on and off. Okay. Another word for turning something on and off is to toggle it. Okay. So uh, the first part of that, though, is we are using a switch. Now, the cool thing about that is we have access to an event that will handle that. Remember, I said we have events and actions. An event is something that takes place in your game. In this case, that will be the using of this switch. So you can right-click here inside the Kismet Editor, inside of its main uh, pane, and you will see a context menu appear with all of the different types of sequence objects you can create. You have actions, and if you open up the actions, you're going to see another list of menus that have a big, long list of the various actions you can create. And there, loads of actions. There are a lot of them. We're not going to go over all of them. In fact, we're barely going to make a dent in what's available. You have matinee uh, sequence objects that you can create, which handle all of the animation that you're going to need. You have uh, conditions. If you need to check, uh, compare two variables against one another. If you need to check, you know, is a character carrying the flag? And if so, we can do something to them or do something to the level, etc. and so forth. You can create variables and you can create events. Now, what we want to do is create a specific type of event for when a trigger is used. And we, if we come down to New Event, you're going to see a Used Event. So we can go ahead and click on that. And it just says Used, but we don't really know what has been used. So what we need to do is to set up our object with, into our interaction lines. So we need to actually select our trigger in the map, and then we could click the little green arrow, and it would assign our trigger. To me, that's a long way to go about this. And there's an easier approach. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit the delete key and nuke that out. Let's close Kismet for a moment. I do have my trigger selected. I've jumped back into the map just to illustrate. You want to make sure the trigger is selected. Let's pop back into Kismet, and I'll expand that, make it full screen. Just right-click, and you'll notice you have new event using, in my case, trigger 3. It could be any number on your end. And we'll come down to use. But, but before you click that, notice we've got if the trigger was touched, if it was destroyed, if it takes damage, or, of course, if it was used. That's right. So there's all sorts of different in-game events that you can have spawn your Kismet sequence. So let's go ahead and just use the use. Initiate your sequence. I like that. There you that. go. Initiate, launch, or be the <laughs> catalyst to. Execute. Okay, <laughs> so here we are. We've got trigger three now. All right, now we need to uh, figure out what action we need. We know we want to turn the light on and off, which, again, another word for that is to toggle. So let's right-click again, and let's go under new action. Because it is an action that we're looking to have take place. That's right. Remember, kismet is just events and actions. An event is something that takes place in the game. An action is something that takes place in reaction to, or like in retaliation to. That's right. So we come over to Toggle, and we have a lot of different types of toggles. Toggle Input, Toggle HUD, Toggle Hidden. You can even Toggle God Mode if you want to. <laughs> We're just going to do a generic toggle, and what this does is this will activate or deactivate some element, some actor in your map. Now, because of where I right-clicked, these two nodes are not placed very well, in my opinion, in relation to one another. We would want to move them around. And navigation inside of the uh, Kismet editor is very similar to the navigation in a lot of the different editors available inside of Unreal Ed, also with the uh, orthographic viewports. You're going to drag with the left mouse button to pan the camera around. If you drag with left and right mouse together, you're zooming in and out. So I'm just dragging up and down right now. And then if you want to move nodes around, you just select one by clicking on it and then hold the control key and drag it around. If you don't hold control, you're navigating the camera. That's right. Okay, so we have an event, we have an action, and now we need to transfer data or you know, some sort of information, some signal from one to the other. We have an output connection here in, on our event. Let's just drag from this, and we get a connection wire. And we can plug this into any of the inputs available on our toggle. But this is where we really have to think, what do we want the sequence object, the toggle object, to do? Do we want it to turn on, turn off, or toggle? Well, if we ask it to turn on, if we were to wire the out of our trigger three used on the left-hand side over to turn on, well, all it's going to do is simply turn the light on if we were to, well, use the trigger. But the light's already on. Right. So we're not going to see anything. That's right. So if you use the trigger multiple times, all you're doing is continuing to turn the light on. But it's already on. Exactly. Now, we could turn the light off, which means it would turn off one time, and we would see that effect, but then we'd never see it turn off again. Right. Now, toggle is going to give us the effect that we're looking for, where if it is on, we'll toggle it off. And if it's off, it'll toggle back on. Exactly. And you have a lot of options here. If you wanted to, you could create another trigger and connect that to off, connect this one to on. So you have one switch that turns the light on mm -hmm. and another switch down the way that turns it off. You That's have right. all sorts of options you can play with here. Now, what I'm going to do is just drag a wire from the output of our event into the toggle input 
of our toggle sequence object. Now, and at this point, we're sending over that toggle signal. We're mm-hmm. telling it, toggle. That's right. But what are we telling to toggle? Because just by putting the sequence object in place, we haven't associated it with the light. That's right. We need to actually tell this toggle uh, node, if you will. I'm gonna, you're going to hear me use the word node a lot. We're going to need to tell this toggle node to speak directly to that light and activate and deactivate it. You'll notice it happens to have a target. That target is who are we targeting this to. That's right, and that's actually a really good point we need to go ahead and bring up, and that is kind of the uh, the architecture or the... Uh I'm trying to think of the right word for it. <laughs> what you're going to see on each one of these uh, sequence objects, you're going to see a series of connections. Now, where are these connections placed will determine what they do. On the left-hand side, you're going to have some sort of input, which is always going to cycle to some other sequence object. Uh, they will only connect from one to another. Like, for example, we're going from our event into this action. On the bottom, you have various connections, which in most cases will plug into variables of some sort, and in some other cases will plug into separate events, but that's kind of an advanced topic we're not going to get into right now. So what we need to do here is plug this target into some style of uh, a variable. And, oh, to, and to quickly finish what you were almost done with a second ago, almost and on the right-hand oh, yeah, side of course. is oh, our output connection. And on the right-hand side, you have outputs. <laughs> that means that in general... In, I say that very uh, in general, capitalize that, data will flow from left to right. Now, that kind of fluctuates based on where you position your nodes. I mean, I could, if I wanted to, put this node over here as we get through a quick autosave. So now, I mean, it looks like data is no longer flowing from left to right, but it kind of is because it's flowing from left to right, but it's following this wire to get over there. That's right. So it just it, generally speaking, data will flow from left to right. And you will see scenarios like that when we start looping data back on itself. That's right. So we need, again, getting back to the subject of hand, we need to connect some sort of a target into our target input. Let's go ahead and uh, close Kismet for now. You Feel free to close it or minimize it, whatever you're most comfortable with. And what I'm going to do is select our toggleable light here inside of our viewport. We'll reopen Kismet. And I have a couple of choices here. I can right-click, and I can choose new variable, and I can choose an object variable, and just choose an object. And because I have my light selected, I can click the little green assign arrow button, and now we are talking to that light, Mm -hmm. which is great, but that's not really the way I like to do it. We can also right-click and choose new object variable using point light toggle level 4. Boom. And there's our light. There we go. Another cool one, though, and see, here's the thing, though. This is now floating out in space. This has still got to connect it up. Yeah, this has to go ahead and connect it real quick. We can just drag a wire from our target right down there. Boom, it's color coded. It fits perfectly. And now, technically, our sequence is done. But if I delete this, there's too much work. Two steps there. There's an even easier way. Just right click directly on your connector, and it says new object variable using point light toggleable four, and there you go. Already connected. You can see if I control drag it, it's already hooked up. So we're set to go. That was very simple. Okay, so let's give this a shot. We can close our Kismet window. Let's right-click and choose Play from here. And here we go. Let's walk up and use our light switch, and boom, the lights go out. Hey, hey. We do have one little problem, though. (laughs) Here it comes. Let's use the light switch again. We can't trigger it anymore. That's right. It was only able to be triggered one time. That's right. By default, events inside of Kismet can only be initiated one time. So let's pop back into Kismet, and let's take a look at our event. Inside of our properties window, we're going to see a bunch of different properties that pertain to this uh, this event. We have aim to interact. Do you want to make the player look at it? Uh, is this enabled? Can only the player use it? There's a lot of different things in here. But of most importance to us is max trigger count. This is the maximum number of times you can use this event or call on this event inside of Kismet. By default, this is always set to 1. If you only wanted to be able to turn the light on and off three times, you'd set this to, what, 6? To 6, yeah. Because on, then off, and, or off, then on, then off, then on. Then exactly. Off, then so on. let's set it to six real quick, and then we'll pop back in here. And so there's six, and now it's useless. That's right. We can't get anything else out of it. Now look at the tooltip when Zach goes back in there. It's actually going to tell you what you need to do if you want it to be an infinite setting. Here it comes. There it goes. Zero for infinite. There you go. So let's set this back over to zero. And now if we close this, let's jump back into our level. And we can just go crazy on the E key and turn those lights on and off like a disco if we want to. There you go. So that's a quick look at a very, very simple Kismet sequence. I mean, in this case, it is a single event leading to a single action. 
And That's right. as you can see, even some other simple effects, like what, you know that timed light switch we had earlier, get a lot more complex than this. Now, once you actually start using Kismet to mod various levels or to create your own levels, you're going to find that it gets very, very complex, and you'll be sending data everywhere. These wires will connect to all different points. Don't worry. There are ways that you can uh, keep that... Uh, more organized, organized, if you will. Yeah, that's right. There's ways you can really keep a, a tight rein on exactly where that data is flowing. I did want to say this, though, uh, just uh, kind of off the cuff, and I'm sure it'll come up a little bit later as we work through this. If for some reason you needed to send data to this light again, like maybe you've got another switch which also affects this light. Uh, in fact, hey, you bear with me a minute. Go right ahead. Let's do it. I want to show, show people something. I'm just going to hold down Alt and drag out a second switch, just for sake of ease. We'll pop back into Kismet. Which is open bottom left. Which, yeah, which I do so often. <laughs> Let's right-click and create a new event. And uh, this, we'll just make another used one. So we have uh, a, another trigger. What do we want it to do? We also want it to toggle. This is uh, what I wanted to get into here was that you don't always have to right-click to create new actions because sometimes that can get very tedious. One of the key factors for efficiency is to be able to copy and paste uh, nodes and reuse them. So we can hit Control-C, Control-V, and we end up with another toggle, and notice it's already connected to our light. So let's go ahead and just run this over to the toggle as well, and let's close this out. We'll pop back into our level, and we have... One that works, and this one, which I think we can only use once because we never changed that max That's trigger count. That's right. But they're both doing the same thing. However, you notice these wires kind of laying back over everything. And this could be a little confusing. Let's say maybe you had 20 different triggers that all affected this light. This could get very complex very quickly. You don't have to worry about it. If you would like to, you can have multiple copies of this Light, all I did was Control-C, Control-V again, and this causes no extra overhead. You're still talking to the same thing. So I just, just kind of wanted to throw that out there and show you really quickly how you can make more complex sequences just by duplicating. That's right. Now, what we're going to do in the next few videos is we're going to build on to this right here. We are going to create that sequence that we showed you at the beginning of this video that has the light system that counts down, shuts off, restarts, counts down, turns back on. That's right. And as we go through this, you're going to see a lot of scripting-oriented things, such as looping, mm -hmm. which is something that, you know, coders do that. Ooh. But don't <laughs> worry. We're going to make it all very simple and easy to follow along with. All right. So with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.